for me prayer is is the burden that I carry in my spirit to see the manifestation of the things that I read in the Bible and they are too overwhelming in my spirit for me just to watch them and say wow that's a good scripture you'll open your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 17 verses 26 a very famous very famous portion of scripture if you've been in the church for quite some time the Bible says and I'll, I'll go straight into the word God has made of one blood all nations of men one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the boundaries or bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us for in him we live in him we move in him we have our own being as certain also of your own prophets have said for we are also his offsprings somebody shout hallelujah we're his children now why i love this portion of scripture and by the way when i see different colors of people here that's how heaven will look like this, this is exactly how heaven will look like because the bible says he has made of one blood all nations it's one blood all nations not different nations, different bloods. One blood, all nations. And God says he appointed their times before and their boundaries of habitation. So he said you'd leave this part of the world. I would live 7,000 kilometers away. That, is the, that was ordained by God. It's beyond your control or mine. To what purpose? To what end? Why are you here? Why am I where am I, I'm supposed to be? The Bible says that we should seek the Lord if happily we might fill after him and find him. And I've said this before to my congregation, that God cannot be found by people who don't fill after him. In fact, primarily, we seek God to the end that we will feel the way he feels. And when we are drawn to his heart and how he feels, then we find him. Because in finding him, beyond the gifts that we have, we are assigned. We are mandated by him to do our part on the earth. I believe every man, every man and woman, listen to me here right now. You have a God-ordained purpose on your life. Whether you are serving it or not, or some are probably serving another purpose. But whether you want, you believe it or not, God has ordained everyone for a specific purpose on the earth. And the Bible says now, he has appointed you wherever he, uh, no, a time for you on the earth as he has appointed it. And the boundary is where you will habitate, that you'll seek him if happily you might feel after him and find him. But where I wanted to lay my emphasis this evening is, though he be not far from us all. This is where I wanted to lay my emphasis this evening. God is not far from man. Man is far from God. There are people who say, oh, why is there a lot of suffering in the world? Where is God? Why would he let a little child die of cancer? Where is God? Why did he let my mother die before time? Where is God? Why would he allow my father to be such a wicked man? Why would he let my brother get into drugs and, and, and waste his life unto death? Where is God? People think that God is far from us. In fact, some of us in the Christian faith, some of you know of a song. It says, Lord, you seem so far away. A million miles or more it feels today. Some of you have sung it. I sang it once. But I repented. Why? Because I read the Bible. The Bible says... Though he be not far. 
God is not far from us. We are far from God. You remember the beginning of, 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 of human existence as we, we, we remember it. Some of you read the Genesis. Adam and Eve, when they ate the forbidden fruit, God did not run away from Adam and Eve. No. Adam and Eve ran away from God. The Bible says when the woman ate the fruit, she gave the man and told him, eat also. When the man ate also, the Bible tells us they fell. The eyes of both were open and they realized that they were what? They were naked. What did they do? They got some leaves, covered their parts, and hid themselves. When they heard God in, in the form of the voice, in the cool of the day, walking through the garden, they are fallen. They have broken the law. But the, we hear God saying, Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Man is at his worst state. He has broken the instruction God gave him at the beginning of life as we know it. But God is still pursuing him because he wants to reason with him. He wants to cover him. He wants to restore him. He wants to build a plan to get him out of the mess he put himself. God is not far from us. We are far from him. When you understand what that means, you realize God has not refused or failed to heal us. We are far from receiving what he has availed in Christ. God is not far from delivering you from that issue. No, you are far from receiving of him what he has already availed by Christ. The only problem is that even us as Christians, we have misrepresented God by the doctrines or teachings that we have received which were ideas of men about a God they knew not, but they tried to paint him uh, according to the father that raised them, according to the mother that raised them. Do you know how many people today don't have a relationship with God, the father, because he reminds them of their father? Do you know how many people cannot relate with God today because he reminds them of their uncle, their grandfather? He reminds them of their immediate boss. He reminds them of the worst version of themselves. And so they cannot relate with God because they have a wrong understanding, a wrong vision of God. That is why men are walking away from God. Because partly we, even us who stand here to preach about him, misrepresent this loving God. We misrepresent his heart towards men. We misrepresent his works. I have met people one time uh, I met a gentleman and he was suffering from a very uh, bad disease. And I told him, do you know I can pray for you and that disease heals? Do you know what the guy told me? He told me, no. God can't heal this one. I believe that he can do anything, but this one, no, he can't heal it. Not, not because he does not believe in the power of God to heal, but somebody told him that his kind of disease God had to leave it on him to teach him something. Listen, God didn't need to leave disease on you to teach you something. That's a misrepresentation of God. That's talking about a God you don't know. And when we teach about that God which we do not know, how else will people believe if what we're defining is not him? He says, if I be lifted from the earth, he said, I will draw men to myself. We have firstly to preach the right God to people. God is not far from you. You are far from God. We can be far from God because of our ignorance. We can be far from God because of our pride, our inflated egos, our indifferences. Whatever reasons they are, I find that man is far from God than we are. Sorry. Man is far from God. He is not far from us. The scriptures tell us here, the next verse as you read it, he says, for in him, now he's talking about you and I who believe in him, we live, move, and have our own being. How, how would he be far if in him we live, in him we move, and in him we have our own being? How would he be far? If what defines you is in him, 
if the mystery of salvation was that you entered God, Jesus in prayer said, I pray that we might be one. They in me and I in you that we might be one. That the world will know that you sent me. That was his prayer. And I believe Jesus, I mean, God would answer, would, would answer any prayer or every prayer. But most of all, I believe that the prayer of the Christ was answered. And that's the mystery of salvation. When we say we are born again, what does that mean? It doesn't only mean we believe in God. It also means that now we not only belong to God, but we belong in God. That's the mystery. Paul says that was hidden from the ages past and now is revealed. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. That mystery of Christ being in you and you being in him. That is one of the wealthiest experiences any believer could ever have. Because when people are relating with God, they relate with him as one who is in heaven and they're here on the earth. I love the words of this great man called T.L. Osborne. He said, we don't pray for power from on high to come on the earth anymore. We pray for power from within us to evade the earth and fill it. Why? Because he understood the mystery that it is God who works in you both to will and to do according to what? To his power. But that power is the power that he has placed inside every believer. Now to him, the Bible says, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that which he says you dare to ask or think according to the working power that works in you. The power in you as a believer, the Bible says, is exceedingly abundantly above that which you dare to ask or think. In other words, if you say I'm going to make the wildest prayer, God says the power I have put in a believer way surpasses the deepest and highest prayer that man can ever make of me. In other words, what I've put in you, you don't even have the language to pray through, to interpret fully and express on the earth. That is why we thank God for the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says, sometimes we know not how to pray as we ought. But by groanings, the person of the Holy Spirit prays through us. Why? Because there comes a time where God wants to do things out of you that you have no language for. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's possible for God to do out of you something you have never imagined. That's why he says eyes have not seen. Ear has not heard. It has not entered the hearts of man. Eye has not heard. Ear has not heard. I'm sorry, eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. It has not entered the heart of man. What he has prepared for them that what? That love him. But the Bible says, but God has revealed it unto us by his spirit. That means you carry the revelation of what no man has ever seen. You carry the revelation of what no man has ever heard. You carry the revelation of what has never entered the heart of man. God is still in the business of doing things we have never even read. If you have heard about it, then that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the innate power of the human spirit that has believed God. You see, people say, oh, you know, uh, our generation is gone. America is gone. God cannot come through this anymore. Yes. As long as there are believers on the earth, as long as there are still believers in America, I have good news for you. He can still turn things around. Because his spirit remains. His, his spirit still remains. I'm not telling you things we have not proved. I'm not telling you things I read in a textbook. I'm telling you things that are happening in my country. I'm telling you things that have never happened in the history of my nation, but are happening in our generation. I'm telling you things that when people see, they cannot believe. They don't believe. We do crusades of 40, 50,000 people, 60,000 people. The one we're having on August is going to be 100,000 people. <laughs> Glory to God. And I'm here in a park somewhere in Lowell. 
speaking the same voice, sorry, the same language, hoping that somebody here, they don't need to be four, they don't need to be five, they don't need to be six, but somebody here will join their faith with me and we believe God for this nation. Somebody shout hallelujah. That somebody will believe God for this nation. I, I might not be talking to you. Maybe I'm talking to your neighbor. But I pray that your neighbor, the one I'm talking to, goes home with this thing. Somebody shout hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. When we read in scripture and saw the things Jesus used to do, because as partly raised in religion for so many years, I doubted this thing called miracles. I used to doubt miracles. I believed anything, but not, how do you tell me that a blind eye can see? How? How do you tell me that a deaf ear can open? How, how does that even happen? Why? Because religion told us that those, those were just stories. Or for some of you, they happened then, they no longer happen now. And then as I grow up, I read, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I say, if you did it then, it means you're the same Jesus now, and you're the same God going to do it through my children. And we took steps of faith and started praying for the sick. My first miracle I saw was a stage four cancer of a woman who was three months to death. She had a swelling in her stomach. It was so big, the doctors told her it was too big to be operated. And she had gone past age to be operated. And so they gave her morphine and sent her home to die. This is, a, this is machines telling you we can't operate this woman because it is too big. The tumor is too big. And they sent her home to die. She comes to say bye to my mother and tells her the story and she's bleeding. And my mother, my mother tells her, no, I have a boy who can heal you. He, <laughs> he, he talks about divine health. Hi, can I call him for you? So I'm in my room there, seated, meditating on the goodness of God. My mom comes and knocks on the door. Ba, 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 ba. And she said, come. You talk about divine healing. I think you can heal this lady. So I say, what's wrong with her? Oh, she tells me the whole case. And I go in my mother's living room and I ask this lady, you believe you can be healed? She said, yes. I got anointing oil, put it on the forehead, prayed for her. Three days after, she's not bleeding anymore. After one week, the tumor has disappeared. That is more than 15 years ago. That woman up to today is still preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she's in her mid 80s. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the God I'm talking about. I am saying that in him, that one who still heals today, you live. In him, you move. In him, you have your own being. God is not far from us. We are far from him. There is nothing he can't do. There is nothing he cannot do. Back in the days to think, ah, you know, becoming a preacher, you, you have to, I mean, fail in life and then say, okay, now nah, let me choose the profession of, of being a preacher. That, that's why they used to think, oh no, we went to school. You, you know, we asked, we were very, very smart kids. You know, I banked for years, so as I'm a, I was a professional banker, grew up the ranks very quickly. And then I saw a God <laughs> who can open blind eyes. And I said, bye-bye banking. Let me go heal people. <laughs> Glory to God. Tell your neighbor, Jesus is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And in him you live, move, and have your own being. That is why I declare upon your life, you will not die early. I declare upon your life, I don't care what the doctor said on your body. You will live a full life. You'll go to your graves full of age as a stock of wheat in its season. Because in him you live, move, and have your own being. Jesus is not far from us. 
We are the ones which are far from him. Take your seats. We're the ones who are far from him. Sometimes I look at the people I could help. <laughs> Bypass us. You understand what I'm saying? Recently I was playing basketball. A boy broke his hand. You, you like breaking the hand? So he goes to the doctor. They put this, what do you call it? What? Cast. Yeah, sorry, excuse, excuse my German. <laughs> so they put a cast on his hand. And, and so the guy comes out. I, I'm coming out of, a, 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 of the hall where we're, we're playing basketball. And he meets me with a broken arm and said, Apostle Grace, I broke this arm today in the middle here. But I'm not going back home with a broken arm. I said, what? He told me, I'm not going back home with a broken arm. Whatever you do, I'm healing now. Now, it wasn't a moment of prayer and worshiping God and, 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 and making sure that I'm full of the Spirit. Now, I stretch my hands in faith. And I say, be done unto you according to your faith. Heal. Next day, the boy comes and says, no, they removed it. I'm, I'm okay. And he was swinging the same hand. He broke the... Now, if I don't testify about that God, what will I testify about? A new Hyundai? A new Mercedes Benz? No. I can't, can't testify about cars. I testify about the one I know. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout glory to God. Now, I read a portion of scripture, and I've talked about it once back home. I want to read it for you because I believe that somebody this evening must understand exactly who you really are. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout amen. Mando bradega, sola badega too. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Are you there? Bear with me. I'd not plan to share it, but I feel somebody needs it this evening. Thank you, Lord. This is Paul speaking, Romans 15. Verses 29. Romans 15, verses 29. Paul says, let's read it. He says, I am sure that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, I am sure that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ? The Bible has told us in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 19. I'm going to read it for us there. If you have the amplified version, get it for me. I want to explain what they call the fullness of the gospel of Christ. Paul says in Ephesians 3.19, are we there? No, let me begin from verse 17. He says, may Christ through your faith, Christ through your faith, dwell, abide in your hearts. May you be rooted deep in and founded securely in love. May you have the power, the Bible says, and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints. What is the breadth, the length, the height and depth of it? That you may really come to know practically through experience yourselves the love of Christ. Now listen how this love is manifested. Which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. He's saying, you know, it's one thing to know that Jesus loves you because the Bible tells you so. It's another to know that Jesus loves you because you have experienced that love. And he says that if he can draw you to the experience of that love, the Bible says you may be filled 
through all your being and to all the fullness of God that you may have, listen, the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. I asked myself, is, is it possible? Not that I doubted it, but it came to my spirit. Is it possible that a man can be filled and flooded with God himself and carry the richest measure of his presence? And Ephesians said, it's possible. It's possible for one human being to carry the richest measure of the presence of God. Not a measure, not a rich measure, the richest measure of the presence of God. It is possible for a certain woman somewhere in this ground, on this ground, to be flooded and filled with God himself, that they would bear the richest measure of God's presence. What would the richest measure of God's presence in a human being do? Can I tell you, those are the things that made prayer on beyond routine, beyond discipline on my life. For me, prayer is, is the burden that I carry in my spirit to see the manifestation of the things that I read in the Bible. And they are too overwhelming in my spirit for me just to watch them and say, wow, that's a good scripture. How can you read that portion of scripture and not pray? How can you discover that according to the Bible, God can actually give you the richest measure of his presence? That he can fill your body to the brim where when you walk, people say, that's God moving. And, and he, he can put that in a human being. Those are the things that make me break in tongues and I find myself praying up to late in the night. Why? Because imagine for a moment, or at least I have tested that, I've seen the dead raised, I've seen the crippled, I've seen deaf ears open, I've seen blind eyes see. If you don't know it, go on YouTube and check me out, you'll see. My point is, this is even, what I'm talking about is even beyond that. I'm talking about a man walking in America with the richest measure of the presence of God in his life, what would your community look like? What would your kid on drugs look like if he encountered the presence of God in its richest measure on your life? What would happen where you live? What would happen to the people you work with if you encountered, if they encountered you with the richest measure of the presence of God on your life? And to even think that God can give all of that to one person. And then duplicate or replicate it in another person. And then replicate it in another person. And then two or three gather with the richest measure. And then 15 gather with the richest measure. And then 200, 300, 400 gather in that measure. And, and they all have the same thing inside their spirit. Do you know what our generation would look like? That is why I told people I refuse to die a normal life. I refuse to live my generation the way I found it. By the time I leave this earth one day, they must say that there was a little small man that knew God. Shout amen somebody. Shout hallelujah. Do you know today... When we start telling people that the things we have seen in God, many people struggle to believe that those things are true. Not because God cannot do them, but because they have not seen them, neither have they had a full revelation, full revelation of who God is. They, they have been given a very funny picture about who God is. God is some random idea. You find a fellow telling you, I don't believe in God and I don't, I don't believe in God. And, and you feel, your heart is like, I wish this person has walked where some of us have walked. Seen what we have seen with our own eyes. Just as the thing John says, that which we have seen, touched, tested, handled concerning the word of life. He says, we pray that you, you, you may come in fellowship with us and experience it for our fellowship is with the Father. 
and the Lord Jesus. That's what John was saying. He said that it's, it's a hard thing for you to experience the God you know and not want every man to test, to, to, to feel the same thing, to connect to the same thing because it's the thing that gave you life. We, we, you, we too doubted this God we're talking about. Somebody shout hallelujah. But because we studied and tested and so we found ourselves testifying of the same God. Now Paul tells people in that boldness, I'm coming to you. Imagine a man telling the church, I'm coming to you in the fullness of the gospel of Christ. In other words, when I'm among you, whew, everything you know about Jesus will manifest. What a faith. What a faith. No, he's not bringing, you know, philosophy. He's not displaying some vain glory. He's not even looking for popularity. No, that's not what he's looking for. He's saying, I, there's something I'm full of, and I'm coming in that fullness to minister to you. I imagine the people that sat under Paul. How were they feeling? To sit listening to a man who had experienced Christ to that magnitude. I mean, the guy says, as a master builder, I laid the foundation. No other man can lay any foundation except that which I have laid. And you can only build on and take it how you build because some of you are going to build with gold, some of you are going to build with silver, stubble, hay, and it's going to be tested by the fire of the Holy Ghost because God has to prove you. What a confidence. Paul reaches to his end times, I mean the last days of his life to die. You hear him make statements like, sometimes I'm torn betwixt, as of to be with you, or to go and be with the Lord. Listen, this man is literally saying that to die for him was a choice. No, Paul literally said it. He says, sometimes I'm torn between. Read. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm in a straight betwixt two. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Next verse. Verses 24. He says, nevertheless, he says, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. That means, Paul, <laughs> was that a man who was even conscious that a man, you know, you know, we have people who say, you know, you could wake up one day, I mean, Sorry, we could wake up one day and you're dead. That's, it happens. It's, it's a normal thing. Oh, yes. Not to Paul. Paul had a choice. He says, I'm confused. Should I be in the body for you? Or should I go and be with the Lord? Which is a far better thing. And he says, nevertheless, for now, let me stay in the body. That's not a man cancer would kill. Oh, that's... That, that, that's, that's not a man who would die in a car accident. That's not a man who would die on a plane crash. Why? Because his destiny is ordained by a life higher than any man can define. That is the gospel. I don't think many people can understand what I'm saying. But I believe somebody on this ground understands what I'm saying. How can a man... I mean, remember, there's a story. Paul is from the island Malta. On the island Malta, they've just escaped shipwreck. The scriptures tell us he goes to make a fire. And as he makes a fire, a viper comes from the fire, the Bible says, and strikes his hand. A snake, a viper. Now, you almost think he would run forward, black stone, emergency, try to do, what do they call it? First aid, I've seen people who are bitten by snakes and, and, and they, they're, they're pulling out the what? The poison out of their hands and sp their mouths and with their mouths and spitting it on the ground. Does that have a name? Okay, you understand it. So the Bible says, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, Acts 28 verses 23, and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. Next verse. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, thou, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth 
him not to live. This man is bitten by a, by a, by a, by a venomous snake and he just shakes it off. And the story tells us he just continues doing his business. As though nothing happened. Next verse. Next verse. Verse 7. How be it. Oh no, 6, sorry. How be it. They looked when he should have swollen. Or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while. They saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds and said. That he was a god is that the bible you read check somebody and tell him build some faith i don't know who i came for this evening but i'm about to finish my sermon listen a man goes to the fire shakes off a viper and continues attending to his business like nothing has happened. Because he knows in him he lives. In him he moves. And in him he has his own being. You see, when you understand that you have your own being in Christ, that means you're more than a human being. You, you, you are a Christ being. Because Christ dwells inside you. This man, sh this, this, listen, this, this, this is the foundation of the gospel. This is the only reason why the gospel has been preserved these many years. I mean, we're still quoting Paul because he dared to believe God. He saw with his spirit what some of us understand only with our minds. The man shook it off. And continued doing his own business like nothing had happened. And the Bible says, they started to study him and say, uh -huh, let's see whether some harm will come on this fellow. Let's see whether he will drop dead because this is venomous. And when they saw nothing, nothing before him, they said, you know, change their mind and say, this man is a God. Some of you people are about to give you names. <laughs> people are about to name you. Shout Amen. People are about to name you. People are about to name you. People are about to name you. I gave a story of, 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 of my, my, my sister. She goes to the doctor and they told her she has HIV. And I said, no you don't. I got her hand and I took her to the hospital. And I said, check her again. Check her again. She didn't have HIV. I sat there. And I was telling the devil, I better not find it there. <laughs> they checked the same blood and it was negative. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Because I realize we have a life. We have a name that is above every name. That at the sound of that name, every knee bows. And every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. What is drugs? I had a lady in my church who were doing a healing meeting. She went and brought her boy from rehab. This guy had been taken to every rehab you know. Every rehab you know. And he could not heal. The best, the most expensive in the region. She had, we're doing a healing meeting. She brought, she, the, the rehab center had refused to even release him. She said, this is my son. I have to go with him today. They bring the fellow to the ground. And that was the last time. That was the last time. He got two miracles. One of them was alcohol. He left. He never put his lips again on a bottle of beer. Never. No spirit, no nothing. The other was a bodily healing. I'm telling you, what's not possible with man is possible with God. What's not possible with man is possible with God. Don't limit God to where you are. I don't know how far you came here. I don't even know how you came here. But this is what I know. That I want to pray with you this evening. 
And the prayer I want us to make with God is that may the eyes of our understanding be flooded with enough light to come to the full apprehension. At least have a spiritual encounter and have a distinct understanding of what he has placed inside you who believe. And that you will start living a life that not only reveals that the Christ in you was raised from the dead, but that he is alive and working fully in you. America does not need another prayer meeting. You don't need another worship session. You just need men and women who are able to carry this thing and take it somewhere and it shall perform whatever it must perform and you'll see the world follow you. You will see the world follow you. It is possible. Somebody shout amen. amen. It's almost as though today you can read the Bible and people still doubt. You know, we have Christians who don't even believe God in whatever we read, but they are believers, but they don't believe that certain things can be done. Well, I'm the crazy kind. I believe in anything. I, I, believe, in en I believe anything can happen this evening. Anything. Anything. I mean anything. Praise the Lord Jesus. If you came with a swelling, I believe it, it's going to disappear this evening. No, this evening. If you have an ear that is not hearing, I believe it's going to open this evening. That's what I believe. If you came with an incurable disease, an addiction, I believe it's going to leave this evening. Not next week, not next year. This evening. Somebody shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. God is not far from us. God has not failed to heal us. We've just failed to believe him or receive from him. God has not failed to revive America. God has not failed to revive any nation. It's the nations that reject him. He has not rejected us. The Bible says even when we believe not, he still abides faithful because he cannot deny himself. Now, you can live all your life speaking from here. Or you can make the decision to actually believe God fully. But you can't, you can't do both. Some of you would rather stay in the boat of faith than walk on water with Peter. Some of us chose long ago that if you find us, you'll find us trying to walk on water. We, we could sink. But we know that if we do, there's a hand that will reach out to catch us and let make sure we won't drown. Why? Because we left the boat long ago. I remember you, there was a time I was in fellowship years ago. And let me say this and I'll finish with that. Many years ago I was in prayer. And the spirit told me, why don't you just let your faith loose? Why, why don't you just release yourself and choose to live ever on the edge To walk in the impossible than always being in the comfort zones of life. Because I was the believer that only understood faith from the comfort zones. What do I mean by, by that? I meant faith would only be applicable where I saw reason and logic. Where it was reasonable, where it was logical, I would agree and say, ah, now I think one plus one is two. With God, all things are possible. Why? Because possibility began when the math was mathing. Excuse my language again. But I remember that day where I had to make the choice in my spirit. And, 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 and that is consecration. Where you consecrate your body, soul, and spirit to God. And make up your mind to live by faith. And only faith. It's a hard thing to make a decision over. But when you do, it's amazing the thing. I started praying for the sick before the camera, knowing that if I call out somebody, they will appear and be healed. And he has never disappointed me. He has never disappointed me. Are you following what I'm saying? And that's the age I live on every day. I, I want to walk on water every day. I would rather... We, 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 
you understand? The hand reaches out every time I'm drowning to pick me up. Then just stay in the boat. Some of you today or this evening, God wants to release your heart to fully believe him. There's somebody in this ground and you have an incurable disease. It's a cancer. And God wants to heal that cancer today. But you have to make up your mind this evening to say, God, I'm ready to believe you. Unapologetically. I'm ready to look at what your word has said and take it for what it says. And I'm never going to doubt you again. I'm going to pray with that person this evening. And I believe in the few months, weeks to come, you will hear a testimony that came from this ground. That somebody was healed of an incurable disease. One time in my meeting, they brought a, they brought a boy who was crippled. He had a hunchback. You know the hunchbacks? So he had a hunchback and his body had formed into a letter C. And it grew worse until he could not walk. So, well, I just see them carry a boy. I don't know what's wrong with him. I just see a crippled boy bent in the letter C with a hunchback, but with a backbone as well had bent. While I'm preaching and praying for the sick, I just see this boy standing up and running. It's the family that explains to us that for years this boy had, was not walking. I have a video of that. I'm not telling you, you know, things from the sky. I have a video on that. When you see those kinds of things, you start to think, what can this do to my bank account? No, no. I, <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? What can this do to, my, to somebody's marriage? What, what would this power do? Shake somebody and tell them, get some faith in you. You, you, you start to think, what would this do? If I went in a place that is dry and I chose to believe God and I realized it's the same power. It just changes form and meets people with their needs. I don't know who I came for, but I came for somebody. Let's get to our feet. Can I get uh, somebody on the piano here? Let me tell you something. This man of God, why he chose this meeting? There's something he feels. Yeah, people don't get it. Some may not understand him. But I do. That's why I come. I do. I do. Before I saw my first dead body come to life in prayer, I prayed for many who died. <laughs> but when you choose to live on the edge, I just used to tell myself I'm just exercising. It will build enough. And I remember the first time they called me a lady her son died at birth, rode him. She said, give me some time to pray for my own child. They told, they said, okay, let's let you, let's let her pray. She prayed. And then nothing. And then she, she gives them my name and says, call this man and tell him that my boy is dead. Now the nurse told her as the father. So she calls me like, you know you're driving and somebody tells you, uh, your son has died. So I say, which son? <laughs> so by the time I ask, where is he? That carried that little boy's body to the mortuary because they had waited for so long. Carried this little cold body put to, to take in the mortuary. Now the, so I tell the lady, can you give me a few minutes to pray? She said, I will give you the minutes. But I also want you to know they've taken the boy to the mortuary. I just remember parking that car. I said a few words. And the story is, 
as they were putting this boy in that, you know, it's like a wardrobe or something. That, that metallic thing, putting the dead body there in that, in that fridge. The kid coughed back to life. Are you following what I'm saying? <laughs> I knew that day. You know when you defeat a certain level. Th there's a certain confidence that comes to you. I remember during that time there was a lady called Miriam. She's in the church. She calls me of a cousin who had been in a coma for I don't know how many days. Now I just raised a kid. What is a coma? So Miriam calls me, oh, this cousin of ours has been in coma for this long and the doctors don't know, they're about to make a hard decision. I told her I'm going to wake that one up. On phone, I told her I'm going to wake that one up. Don't worry, I'm going to... You hang up the phone, you're going to see. Hang up the phone, the, girl, the person woke up. <laughs> Shout amen! God is not far from you. Draw nigh. Raise your faith this evening. Believe God for your nation. Believe God for your people. You have not yet lost it if you still have a man on American soil with the spirit of God. There's nothing that can't change up to the highest officers. But God wants you to raise your faith again.